Hey guys, today we're going to start uh, chapter two of American government. And the basis of chapter two is called the roots of American democracy. And we're going to really take a look during this chapter at how uh, our grand experiment of the American Republic uh, got started. Uh, the first chapter we were really looking at just some general uh, knowledge about government uh, as a whole. Today we're going to start off uh, our look at the United States of America. So make sure you have notebook out, ready to go, and we'll go ahead and get started with notes. Okay, uh, today we're on Chapter 2, Section 1, The Roots of American Democracy. Uh, two objectives for today. Um, vocab words, bicameral, Magna Carta, Petition of Rights, and English Bill of Rights. And then the other objective is to be able to describe the influences that helped form the American colonial governments and our national republic. <clears throat> okay, English uh, political heritage. It's important to understand um, when we're looking at American government that we got our traditions from England. Okay, The first English settlers did not arrive in America with some master plan for a democratic government. They came as English colonists. Um, primarily, uh, most of them actually looking to uh, make money. Um, they did, uh, while they most often did not arrive with some grand idea of what they wanted to get started, they did arrive with political uh, traditions. And those were English political traditions built on limited government, representative government, and individual rights. Um, these important English ideals took roots in places like Jamestown, uh, Virginia in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, you read on the last uh, test the Mayflower, uh, Mayflower Compact. Okay, That's kind of the same thing. It was built on English political traditions. Um, one of the most influential uh, historians um, of American history was named Frederick Jackson Turner. And he believed that this uh, influence, these colonists that came to America, um, and their struggle with the wild wilderness was what makes America strong uh, even, even today. The fact that we had to struggle just to survive in the wilderness created in us a unique individualism that allowed us as a country to become the strongest nation on the planet. Um, additionally, not being constrained by these old uh, European class systems where you had a king and... and royalty and other things like that was something new to the the American experiment that these colonists all the way from Massachusetts down to Georgia had a chance that nobody else in the world did. Okay, three important English ideals that were were given to us basically by the English. Representative government, limited government, and individual rights. And we're going to take a look at at these. Um, you don't necessarily need to be able to define these. You just need to understand and be able to describe to me how the English political tradition uh, helped form our country. Okay, first of all, let's talk about representative government. Um, English traditions of representative government uh, dated to the 11th century when a council of religious leaders and nobles formed to advise the king. So you, you know that England had a monarchy with a king who uh, during early times had absolute power to do whatever he wanted. Well, in the 10 hundreds AD, a group of religious leaders came together to form a council to advise the king on certain things. Over time, this king's advisory council evolved into a bicameral form of a legislature. You need to know what a bicameral legislature means. It means there are two chambers. The prefix bi means two, okay? Okay? Two chambered legislature is called bicameral. We have that in the United States. We have the Senate and the House of Representatives, which we'll learn about later. Many of the democracies around the world do not have that. We are fortunate in our system that we took after the English, who basically uh, invented the modern bicameral legislature. In England, the upper house, or the more powerful house, became known as the House of Lords, which was made up of noblemen, you know, the wealthy. The lower house, which today is actually the most powerful, but back then was the least powerful, was called the House of Commons. That was made up of local representatives that people 
a limited number of people could actually vote on. Okay? The two houses worked together to advise the king, but also to limit the power of the king. Okay? And that's an important part of representative government. You can still have a king in a representative government, but there has to be some limits on the king's power. And the English system of parliament, that bicameral parliament, limited the power of the king. Okay, and that brings us into the limited government aspect of it. Okay? Um, one of the earliest English efforts to limit the power of the king occurred in 1215, when uh, English nobles forced King John of England to sign the Magna Carta. Magna Carta is Latin for the Great Charter. Um, King John had been at war with France and kept sending armies over to France uh, to try and gain more land for England. And to do that, he had to raise taxes and raise taxes on the nobles or the wealthy. But they didn't want their taxes raised. They didn't have a say on whether they were going to go to war or not. So uh, they rebelled and they actually got all their knights together and marched on England. The king, King John, met uh, the nobles with his knights at a place called Runnymede. And King John was a smart guy because he realized he was going to get beaten during this battle. So he agreed to relent to the noblemen's demands. And this is a famous painting of King John signing the Magna Carta. Um, he doesn't look too happy because he's basically signing over some of his rights as king, saying, I don't have the power to do this anymore. Okay, The Magna Carta was a significant move from the idea of rule by man to the idea of rule by law. Before the Magna Carta was signed, King John, if he said something, it was law. Now, with the Magna Carta, there was a limit on the king's powers. He had to obey certain aspects of the law as well. Okay? By signing the document, King John conceded that even kings had to obey laws. That's what limited government means. The government, in this case, King John was the government, did not have the power to do whatever he wanted to do. Okay, uh, The document also outlined individual rights that the king could not violate. Um, certain things he could not do is he could no longer tax nobles without them agreeing to it. So he couldn't raise their taxes without them saying it was okay. It also, for the first time, guaranteed uh, a trial, a jury trial, for most crimes that were committed. Before this, a judge would just determine what your punishment was going to be, but now a jury of your peers in most cases was allowed. Okay. Originally, this Magna Carta only applied to Englishmen, but many of the traditions in the Magna Carta began to uh, spread to other countries as well. And in, at first it only applied to the wealthy, but over time it began to apply to everybody. Okay. The last tradition of England that influenced us was individual rights. Okay, Now we're moving on about 400 years later. In 1628, a new confrontation happened between the king and parliament. And it put at risk some of those hard-fought rights that were won with the Magna Carta. Okay, Parliament, which was their government, which was their uh, legislature, forced the English king, King Charles I, to sign a new document called the Petition of Rights. This document now took away more power from the king. It required the king or queen to obtain Parliament's approval before he raised any taxes. So now the king can never raise taxes unless he gets the bicameral legislature to agree to it. It also said that the king cannot illegally put people in prison. The king could not force people to have soldiers in their homes and keep soldiers in their homes. And the king could not establish martial law during times of peace. Martial law basically means the military is running the country. These are some important things right here. And actually, most of those things found their way into our Constitution, which you'll see eventually. Okay? The Petition of Right, however, did not end conflict with Charles I. It eventually erupted into the English Civil War in 1642. Um, during uh, what happened here was uh, the armies uh, that Parliament raised eventually defeated the armies that the king had raised. 
until the king, King Charles I, was captured and eventually beheaded by an executioner. Okay. England, from uh, 1649 until 1661, did not have a king. It's important to realize this is unique to England. During this time, the rest of Europe, a king had absolute power. Well, now, the parliament has taken power from the king and went to war with the king and actually executed the king. That would not occur in anywhere else other than England at this time because of the limits placed on the king's power. It's important to realize that, hey, it's important that England founded American colonies and not some other country because we get these English traditions of limited government and individual rights. Um, and it's going to expand even beyond that. In 1689, um, the new king was King James II. He was Catholic, and most of Parliament was Protestant. They did not like the fact that they were going to have a Catholic king. They thought he'd be answering to the Pope, and the Pope was going to be running the show in England. So they once again rebelled against the king in favor of uh, William and Mary and forced them to sign the English Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights further limited the king's power. It said that the king had to get approval for almost everything from Parliament. Now the king can't go to war. The king can't build a ship. The king can't build a road without getting Parliament to agree to it. The English king was losing most of the power that he once had. Um, it also began a little bit of freedom of speech. Okay? In Parliament, members of Parliament could say almost what anything they wanted to without fear of being punished. It also banned cruel and unusual punishment. You're going to see that in our own Bill of Rights as well. The First and Eighth Amendments to our own Bill of Rights take after the English Bill of Rights um, that were uh, signed in the 1600s. Um, another thing that this did is it gave Protestants the right to bear arms. So if you were a Protestant, you had the right to keep weapons in your house because they wanted to make sure that uh, any Catholic king would not be able to, to just punish the Protestants. That's our second amendment right there, the second amendment to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We get that from our English traditions. Okay, um, we discussed the early history of democracy in England, okay, but to better understand the political heritage that Americans uh, inherited, we need to take a look now at the colonies. Um, the colonies that were founded in the 1600s in America were English colonies. They were still subjects of the English king. They had to obey the English king, but they also believed in the democratic rights that were won by challenges to the king. From the very beginning, the colonists in America drew on those political traditions um, to form representative governments with limited power okay, and a representative government. Um, this painting right here is from 1619, the House of Burgesses. Uh, that was the first representative government in the United States. It was Virginia's legislature. Okay, and it's still what the upper house of their legislature is kind of called today. In 1620, the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact was a democratic document. You read that on the test. Okay? Um, in 1639, the Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut Fundamental Orders of Connecticut was kind of a constitution that limited the power of the colonial government and gave all free men the right to vote for judges. In 1641, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties um, established a list of rights that all citizens had um, that the government could not do things against them, such as take their property without a trial. These things didn't just happen out of thin air. And that's what you have to understand. We got these things in our colonial governments because of our English traditions. These experiments were undertaken in the context of what was happening in England at the time, and it's important to realize that the English experiment with democracy influenced what was happening in the United States as well. And when King George III, when we look at the Declaration of Independence later, 
try to take away some of the rights listed in these documents right here, that's what caused the American Revolution. Okay. Um, I'm just going to spend just a little bit on this. The book, which I didn't make you read this section, spends a lot more time. But uh, just a brief look at the colonies that were created, um, the 13 original colonies that were created. When, when these were created, they weren't all created at the same time. It wasn't some master plan by England to have 13 colonies. Okay? There were actually three separate types of colonies that happened. Um, you had proprietary colonies, which were grants of land given to either an individual or a group of people. The purpose of those colonies was to make money. Okay? Um, basically like having an IPO, an initial uh, public offering of a stock. Okay? It's like a new company is coming aboard. Hey, we're going to go to America, we're going to take land, and we're going to make money. That's essentially what those were for. Um, some, though, were founded as a religious refuge as well such as uh, Maryland. The colony of Maryland was formed as a, uh, a refuge for Catholics to get away from England. Um, uh, named after uh, Queen Mary. Um, Pennsylvania was formed uh, basically as a refuge for Quakers um, to get away from England. They were kind of outcasts there as well. Um, the other ones, uh, Delaware was started to make money. Okay. Um, the next type of colonies were a royal colony. These were directly founded by England to expand English power and wealth. So these were colonies not started by somebody trying to start a business. Okay. These were colonies started by England itself trying to expand the power of England and bring wealth back to the home country. Um, each one of these that were established had an English style of government with a bicameral legislature and a governor that was appointed by the king. Some examples, Virginia, okay? Um, the Virginia colony was started by the king of England to expand English power. Um, the vast majority of the colonies were royal co colonies started by England itself. The last uh, type of colony was called a charter colony. Um, those were formed as an agreement between the people that colonized them, and the king of England, okay? These were sometimes started by people just looking to find a better way of life in America. And uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island were the two colonies there that formed as uh, uh, charter colonies. The important thing, you don't need to necessarily know the different types of colonies. The important thing to realize is that the 13 colonies were all formed with the agreement of the king. The king agreed to allow these colonies to happen. They were part of England. So the same rights of Englishmen applied to these people as well. These were not states. Okay? They had territory. They had people. They had government. But they did not have sovereignty. They had to answer to the king of England. So they were not independent states yet. Okay. There's one last thing we're going to talk about with English traditions, and it is not English political traditions, but it is intellectual influences. Other than English political influences, there were some other things that influenced uh, the colonists as well. Um, there was classic republicanism. Okay, The classic republics uh, studied by the Greeks and the Roman Republic were an influence to the people that started our country. Uh, they, they heavily looked at what happened in Rome as an example of what to form our government on. Um, the founders looked to uh, Enlightenment thinkers as well, such as uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, who argued that a Republican government could only survive if you had an educated citizenry. So if we're going to have a republic or a dem democratic form of government, we have to educate our citizens. Okay, that's why we spend so much money on education in the United States today. Um, another Enlightenment thinker uh, that was important was uh, Charles de Montesquieu. He wrote a book called The Spirit of the Law that believed in a separation of powers between a legislature, executive, and judiciary. That's going to heavily influence 
James Madison when he's helping form our government. Um, the framers of our Constitution relied heavily on Montesquieu, one of the most important. Um, Adam Smith, who, who was an Englishman that wrote The Wealth of Nations, about a capitalist or a free enterprise type of economy, was heavily influential on our co uh, colonial uh, uh, founders. And also Judeo-Christian influences. So we talked about the classic republicanism of Greece and Rome, the Enlightenment thinkers of Montesquieu, Machiavelli, and some of the others we talked about in Chapter 1, but also Judeo-Christian influences as well. Um, Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation uh, influenced our country as well. Um, Martin Luther, when he was rebelling against the Catholic Church, really opposed the, the power of the Pope and wanted to give more power to local people and that kind of really started the Enlightenment thinking process that swept across Europe. So we can't take out uh, Judeo-Christian influences as well. Okay, guys, um, big thing to have in your notes. Make sure uh, you have all the definitions you need. Uh, bicameral, what the Magna Carta did, Petition of Rights, English Bill of Rights, and make sure you're able to talk a little bit about the influences of England on our political tradition. Okay, have a great rest of your day, guys. Let me know if you have any questions.